here at A More Beautiful Life Collective, we know that the hectic hurry of everyday life can drown out our focus on what really matters. This podcast is a moment to intentionally pause and realign our focus. Together, we're working to find the rhythm of peace in Him through the pace of beauty and order. I'm Casey Fletcher, and thanks so much for joining me. Hey everyone, and welcome back to a more beautiful Life Collective podcast. I am so glad that you're here and you're back to listen to episode four. All right, so before we get started, there's a couple quick announcements that I have to keep you updated on all the awesome things that are going on around here. First, if you haven't, go ahead and check out our show notes. So our show notes have links to everything that we talk about, the books, other podcasts, guides, everything. And you can also, if you click the show notes, you can click on the link that will lead you to the blog, which has more content that's geared towards making your life more beautiful. So if anything that we've talked about here strikes a chord with you, I encourage you to check out the blog and you will find more information that's just going to help you out um, to live a life that's more intentional and more focused on God. And if you subscribe, you'll get access to our free subscriber library. So basically this library, it has um, devotionals, it has other printables, and it also has the notes that we're using for this class. So if you subscribe to the blog, you'll get an email, and on that email, you'll get the password to the subscriber library. So I encourage you to check it out. I'm adding to it regularly. So again, if you've looked at it, maybe a few weeks ago, go ahead and um, check it back out and you might be surprised at what you find. You can also subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube so that you never miss an episode. If you haven't yet, please, please, please leave a rating and review. It helps others to find the podcast and I would also be just so grateful for your help in growing the community. Now, on to the episode. So, In our last episode, we focus on the role that technology plays in our lives. If you haven't listened to that yet, you can go back and listen because that really sets the groundwork for what we are going to be talking about today. In that episode, we focused on what our current habits of technology are and what we're trying to get out of our technology. Specifically, we looked at the way that technology can be really like an idol in our lives if we're not careful. A lot of times we sacrifice things to technology. We might sacrifice our time, our children, our health on the altar of social media, sports, online shopping, video games, and most of the time we're unaware that we're even doing that. At the end of the last episode, I read 10 TechWise family commitments. This came from the TechWise family. We're going to talk a lot about the TechWise family today, uh, but you can um, look at the show notes and you can get a link to that book. But after reading reading through those, I realized that there is so much more that we could talk about whenever we're thinking about the role that technology can play in our lives and to what extent we actually need to place limits on our technology use. One big question that we need to ask ourselves, and I really want us to focus on this, is whether or not we should live no screens. How would life be different if we decided to live with no screens? Is it even possible and why Why would we even want to? And so today we're really going to be thinking about that question. First, we're going to focus on what technology is doing to us and our kids. And second, we're going to look at some specific pointers which we can use to control our techno- technology habits. I'm basing off what we're talking about today on two fabulous books. So if you're looking for books, if you want to listen to them or read them, um, you can look at the show notes for that. The Books are Reset Your Child's Brain, A Four-Week Plan to End Meltdowns, Raise Grades, and Boost Social Skills by Reversing the Effects of Electronic Screen Time, and The TechWise Family, Everyday Steps for Putting Technology in Its Proper Place. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to get those books and read them. You can find a link to purchase both of those in the show notes. And if you purchase using the link, I get a small commission at no cost to you that really helps um, just us at the costs of different things. And so I just appreciate it if you purchase through that link. So let's start off by thinking about what technology is doing to our brains. All right. So first, I know that this can be a touchy subject because technology just permeates our life. Also, whenever we talk about technology, it makes us feel, I think, a little bit convicted, maybe a little bit uncomfortable because we may be a little bit reliant on technology. Um, and the thing is, I understand it. I really love technology. In fact, if you ask some of my coworkers, they would tell you that I'm 
the tech person. I'm the person that they go to uh, to uh, fix their computers or to figure out what to do with this app. My dad was an engineer and it just seems like I was born with like a computer in my hand. Some of my earliest memories are playing computer games and watching Disney movies on repeat. We have the latest gaming consoles and I just grew up knowing how technology works. And so you would think that with my background that I would be saying that technology is the best thing. And in some ways it is. I love my Instacart. I love to be able to order things on Amazon. But I also know the feeling of being in a brain fog because of too, not, too much screen time. And no matter your age, I think you can relate. So I'm going to go through and list a couple symptoms. And I want you to see if you relate to these symptoms. All right. So first thing, have you ever felt this way? Have you ever experienced time distortion? Like time just slipped out of your fingers. You look down at the clock and you realize that 30 minutes to an hour have passed when you really only meant to spend a few minutes on your phone or just playing a game. Have you ever felt irritation? When someone or something breaks your concentration on technology, you feel irrationally annoyed or angry that they are tearing you away from the thing that you are working on. Have you ever felt wired and tired? So your mind is racing, you can't go to sleep at night, but you are so sleepy and you wake up the next morning in a fog, you need three cups of coffee just to get going. Have you ever felt like you were craving technology? Like you grab your phone or Facebook and Instagram pops up and you really just meant to text somebody on your phone, but it's almost like you have this habit where you need to look at it. You are in a conversation and with somebody and you can't even help yourself. You're looking at your phone. Maybe you are needing to get something done for class and instead of doing that thing, you're looking at your phone or you're playing a video game. Maybe you can't tear your eyes away from the latest show, <laughs> whether that's you know Ted Lasso or the Netflix show that you were binging. You're craving that technology. Have you ever been in this state? So I'm going to use this word hyper arousal. And this is what this means. I'm going to describe for you what this means. But basically you need to think about your brain on technology is described as being hyper aroused. And so this is what this statement means. It means significant dysfunction in school, at home, or with peers. And typical signs and symptoms mimic chronic stress or sleep deprivation and can include being irritable, depressed, or rapidly um, having a rapidly changing mood, excessive or age inappropriate tantrums, low frustration tolerance, poor self-regulation, disorganized behavior, oppositional defiant behaviors, poor sportsmanship, social immaturity, poor eye contact, insomnia or non-restorative sleep, learning difficulties, and poor short-term memory. So this definition of what hyperarousal is um, due to screens is from a book. I'm going to be referring to it a lot and I mentioned it already. It's the Reset Your Child's Brain. It's by Victoria Dunkley and she has um, written a lot about this and so she um, has described what the state is. She even says that ticks, stutters, hallucinations, and seizure activity can be related to screen time. So there's this state of feeling irritable, depressed, and also having rapidly changing moods. And that's related to the state of being hyper aroused. Um, the next one is social immaturity. So this might not be something that you could relate to. Maybe you could, I'm not sure. But you may have seen somebody else, maybe a child, maybe your child, maybe a student that you work with, um, where they're acting a little bit young for their age. Now this could just be with like tantrums and things. So maybe a middle schooler is throwing a tantrum. I've seen that. But it also could be something like a, someone who should be a young adult launching into adulthood, but instead they're delaying things uh, that would be more indicative of their age. So for instance, someone who is delaying, delaying getting a job, driver's license, uh, dating, and instead they're pursuing video games or looking at their phone. Now in this day and age, we live in this epidemic of kids feeling anxious and depressed. And it seems like we don't know what to do. 
If you talk to any of your teacher friends recently, you know, I just recently stayed home. And so, you know, I experienced this last year. We also live in an epidemic of kids just being flat out disrespectful, being hyper, being immature in class. Screens are a constant distraction. I can't tell you how many times I had to tell a kid to flip over their iPad because they were too distracted by it. And, you know, we kind of laugh these things off. Like all of those things I just described to you, social immaturity, uh, hyper arousal, technology craving, being wired and tired, uh, losing time, having this irritation. Many people wish for the days when we could go back and there would be no iPads. But I think though we say that we miss those days whenever we didn't have smartphones or Facebook or iPads, I don't know if we ever really stop and think about the truly negative impacts of technology. We talked about in that in the last episode, some heart issues that we can have where we put technology as idols in our life. But I don't know if we've looked at some of the negative aspects that it can really have on us and our kids. Is there anything really truly bad about it? Or is it just another change like a car, you know, we have good things and bad things. There's car accidents. Um, we don't have a walking culture anymore. There's negative things about cars. Uh, but it's one of those things that I would say we would take the risks with the reward of being able to have a car. And I would think that most people would say there's some drawbacks to technology, to screens, um, you know, excessive use and negative aspects of social media, maybe obesity. But most would say that the risks outweigh the rewards. I'm talking to you right now because of technology. I ordered my daughter's pajamas and they were delivered today and I ordered them yesterday with a click of the button, didn't have to go anywhere. That's pretty amazing. But I don't think we ever stop and think about, okay, is there anything that is truly, truly worse, truly negative happening because of technology and screens? We know that kids don't read books. That's in um, iGen, that book I was referencing earlier. Um, and I've seen that for myself. But most of you would probably say, eh, it's just books. It's really not that bad. But the author of the book, Reset Your Child's Brain, again, I'll read that uh, subtitle too because I think it's important, a four-week plan to end meltdowns, raise grades, and boost social skills by reversing the effects of electronic screen time. Victoria Dunkley, the author of that book, she would beg to differ. The symptoms I read to you before, sleep deprivation, hyperarousal, irritation, time distortion, technology craving, and or addiction. These are all harm hallmarks of a new condition she describes as electronic screen syndrome, or ESS. She is an integrative psychiatrist who specializes in finding alternative ways to treat pa patients in addition to or in lieu of medicine. And what she found is that children who are diagnosed with things like ADHD, bipolar disorder even, depression, anxiety, respond to the prescription of not more medicine, but of a electronic screen fast. And with the fast, she's able to reverse the effects of all of those conditions I just mentioned. She says that ESS uh, can really mimics those conditions. And through her book, she describes a step-by-step -step guide to basically reverse those the effects of those conditions. And we're going to talk about why that is. So the question is how in the world would no screens alleviate those conditions, ADHD, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, why would screens actually impact that? And in the book, she describes how screens impact our minds, our bodies, how we're perceiving the world around us. And what I'm going to do is in this episode, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the things here for you. But if you're interested or if you have to work with a child who has ADHD or any of these other diagnoses, I really, really encourage you to read her book because it's it's pretty eye-opening. And for me, I know as a teacher, I you just kind of get caught in the wave of what's happening. So I know that my kids, basically from the minute you walked in the door of my classroom to the minute that you left, there was some kind of screen, whether it was the screen up behind me, you know, with the notes on it, the iPad in their hand, uh, you know, a video I was playing, it permeated everything that I did. And if, you know, for me at least, even if the kids weren't on a screen, I was on a screen because I needed to do something on my computer. So I just had screens all the time and you don't really think about how it's affecting those kids. Even kids who, you know, they finish all their work and then they go and play these games. Some of the effects I'm about to describe to you, 
you know, I might be giving them 10, 20 minutes in my class where they would have a time on their iPad. And then if they got free time, you know, if they finish a test, which is on their iPad and then they got free time, then they would have, you know, time to play games. And that adds up over the course of a day. And then they're going home and they're playing on their video games or they're looking on their phone till, you know, 12, three o'clock in the morning, some kids would stay up. And we wonder why they're in this state of hyper arousal where they cannot calm down and they cannot go to sleep. And then because of that, that just compounds everything. So we're gonna see how technology affects their brains, but I can tell you for a fact, I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it with my students who were middle schoolers, but I also have seen it with my own son where if he watches screens too much, some of these things have happened. So screens, they affect every part of our life. And so we're gonna go through and look at some different ways. For instance, the first way is just our eyes. So our eyes are meant to be viewing things outside. We're, you know, we were, we're all as a people, we're supposed to be outside. And this is really a modern phenomenon where we're staying inside all the time. And so there's even studies, uh, Jenny Urich, uh, who does 1000 hours outside. One of the studies that she mentions is that our eyes are meant to be outside. And so we're wondering why, okay, all these people are nearsighted. They all need glasses. And it's because our eyes are never getting that workout where we look really far off in the distance. And so that's just a small example of how we need to go outside so that we can give our eyes this workout. Um, there are statistics that kids spend an average of 1200 hours a year on screens with an average of spending four to six minutes outside a day during the school year. So basically we're having, you know, four to six hours on screens every day and four to six minutes every day outside. And so we're never getting that workout for our eyes. There's even a condition which is called computer vision syndrome, which causes blurred visions, headaches, and dry, irritated eyes due to the LED light that's emitted from your, the screens of your computer and your phone. So if you've ever felt like, oh my gosh, my eyes are so dry, it's probably because you have this. <laughs> um, in addition to this, okay, so we talked about our eyes. The next thing is our brains. So our brains are changed because of screen time. And I'm gonna get a little bit technical here, but I think this is important because again, whenever we're asking ourselves, is there anything that's truly negative about screens? This is what it is. So our brain is changed because of screen time. It can affect our fight or flight response leading to heightened arousal. So this is what I mean by this. We think of video games and we know that kids can get worked up because of video games. Think about the latest time, even if you don't play video games, which if you do, you know what I mean, you know, whatever game that is, whenever you're playing the big boss in the game, you get a little bit, you know, on edge. That is a fight or flight response. But you know that from like horror movies, if you've ever watched one of those, you feel that fight or flight response. But we think about this and you know, there's been studies where like, oh, video games aren't that bad. They've actually, you know, negated those studies. I think a lot of that is just due to publicity. And she talks about this in the book that there are actually, uh, for every one positive study on, uh, screen time, there are like 20 negative studies. So it's just that there's a lot of money involved and you have big tech. And so big tech is putting out the studies that show these, these positive things. But there was a study uh, for video games, um, violent video games, that kids who play eight hours or more of like violent gaming a day, they can actually have a PTSD-like response in their brain. And we think, oh, that's a really long time. But some of these kids, you know, they're going home. They might get on their game at like six or, uh, you know, eight, nine o'clock at night. But then they'll game until, again, 12, one, two in the morning. And so, you know, eight hours, that's really not that long if you're putting in those hours, not to mention the time on the weekends where they're playing. So if they have somebody who's not really monitoring their screen time, they could be playing that many hours. But basically, if you're immersed in a world of a really violent video game for that long, that becomes your reality. So you have this like PTSD-like response. But that is not the only thing that causes the state of heightened arousal. It's also the intensity and vividness of the screen, the time usage, um, the 
size of the screen, uh, the lack of sleep because of this. So all of these things, even if you're just looking at your phone watching TikTok videos, or um, if you are you know, watching something, even sports, you are having this happen to your brain where you are getting into a fight or flight response because you're just kind of stressed out. And you can think about this with like little kids. We've seen this happen where little kids get overstimulated <laughs> even nothing related to screens. They can get overstimulated, you know, just being around their friends where they get just a little bit crazy. We call this in my family, we call it lizard brain because we feel like they're going back, to, you know, to the brain of the lizard, their amygdala or whatever. And so because of that, they're just kind of out of it. If you've ever seen your kid get out of it, watching a movie or watching screens, maybe they've been kind of binge watching something on Netflix or something like that. And they just start doing things. And you're like, why are you doing this? What are you thinking? They're probably not thinking because they're in this state of heightened arousal. And so uh, screens, they're designed to trigger a dopamine response so that we keep coming back to them. And they even say that some um, brain imaging has shown that screens affect the same dopamine pathways as other drugs like amphetamines. So yes, it's not like being on on an amphetamine, but it is something where it's triggering the same dopamine response as like an addict would. So we have these things that are causing us to uh, live in the state of heightened arousal, fight or flight response, and then we crave that thing. Uh, again, getting even a little bit more technical, just so you see some of the hard data that shows this, when we constantly live in this fight or flight response, so that heightened arousal response, it can raise cortisol levels. Coffee can also raise cortisol levels, but screens can raise cortisol levels, which throws off your blood sugar, it throws off other hormones, and it can create oxidative stress. So basically what that means is that nutrients like antioxidants and things like that that are supposed to go to your brain are going away from your brain to deal with your fight or flight response because... So what does this do? It leads to cognitive dysfunction impaired social interactions, and mood dysregulation. Again, Dunkley, who's written all about this in her book, she sums it up by saying, research has demonstrated brain shrinkage in processing areas. So if you know your brain, this is the gray matter, including in the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is where we have all of our executive decision-making, uh, where we remember um, our deadlines, where we manage our time. Uh, it also, so in addition, to having shrinkage in the gray matter, it also leads to loss of integrity and connection pathways. So your white matter. So that's where like we are making connections with the world. It also reduces the cortical thickness, so the higher brain areas, and more um, leads to more impulsive but less accurate cognitive processing. And again, when video game addicts are shown cues that induce craving, their brains light up in the same areas that drug addicted brains do. Finally, dopamine receptors may become desensitized, effectively requiring large amounts of dopamine to do the same job. So this is again, going back to that Dopamine Nation book that I read last time. We live in a dopamine um, infused world, but part of what's causing this is the fact that we're so addicted to screens. So just like with a coffee or alcohol or anything else that you can get addicted to, at some point, your baseline goes up and you need more of that thing to still feel good. And so kids who are going to video games, they don't know this. They don't realize why they want to keep playing. But the reason why they want to keep playing and they need to up the ante every time is because it functions in the same way as a drug would. So in other words, to sum it all up, all the, the sciencey stuff, is that every aspect of our minds is affected by technology and screen time. And so it's even worse for our kids. We have a hard time, and I know that you feel this. If you don't, then I think you're lying. We all have a hard time managing our screen time. And so if we have a hard time, then it's going to be even worse for our kids. There's a reason why we don't give kids alcohol or drugs or even things like caffeine. We limit caffeine and sugar because we recognize that it's not good for their brains. And we also don't want them to be addicted to something that they can't break out of. But then why are we doing this with something that's just like all of these other drugs uh, where their brains are literally being stunted by technology because of the heightened stress that they're in? They're so addicted to that substance that they don't want to give it up. Generally, because of this, it, again, if you think about the fact that their frontal lobes are having shrinkage and then these other places are having shrinkage, like their 
their brains are literally being stunted by technology. And if the screen time goes unchecked, a whole host of conditions can pop up, which are traditionally treated with large amounts of medications, whether they're actually needed or not. So for instance, uh, you know, ADHD, what we'd recommend is that they go on medication because it's, if you've ever, you know, being in a school, it's just very, very difficult for a kid who has ADHD, especially severe ADHD. Uh, and so they, they need that to be able to sit for that long of amount of time. They just have to sit and be quiet uh, to be able to survive it. The medications are given, but what if they could be solved if they, the screens were taken away? But one of the issues is that uh, one, screens are used as a reward. Like I said, you know, you finish your test, you can play a game on your iPad. Or, uh, you know, a lot of kids, if they do good in school, a lot of times they're rewarded with being able to have uh, game time either at night or over the weekend or to have their phone. You know, get your phone taken away whenever your grades fall down. And then the reward is that you get your phone back. A couple issues with this is that, one, whenever you're using that technology, mean is being released in your brain. So whenever it's taken away, there's a crash and that crash can lead to irritability or even depression. So behaviors related to a large amount of technology, they can cause depression because of that crash. And this is not just, you know, having a phone taken away. Even as an adult, there are times where you can't be on your phone and you may be wondering, it's like, why do I feel like in a fog? Well, it's because your baseline of what you need as far as dopamine goes has gone up because of your phone usage. And so you cannot get just from living everyday life without technology, you can't get to that same level of dopamine that you need. And so you feel depressed, but you're depressed because you're giving yourself this drug of technology. It also, uh, behaviors related to technology, uh, inside and sitting around a lot, uh, can lead to a lesser production of serotonin. Um, also, you need melatonin to make serotonin. So if you're not getting good sleep, you won't have that. And so because of that, technology use is creating uh, these behaviors that we think there's something wrong with our brains. And so we turn to medication in order to fix the problems. And then what the problem really is, is technology. But a lot of times we don't get to this. And we don't address those those behaviors. In addition to all of this, so again, this is not just, you know, that your brain is shrinking. You also have attention and social behaviors that are related to ESS because, so ESS is the electronic screen, screen syndrome. Because of the brain's inability to develop at the frontal lobe, people who are forgetful, they struggle to keep up with their items, have a hard time getting started on assignments and projects, have trouble staying on task, and are they are generally people who are diagnosed with ADHD, but Dunkley would argue that it's really screens that are causing that because the frontal lobe is never getting fully formed because of this fight or flight response. And so we think, oh, well, they must have ADHD. So you put them on medication, but you're not really solving the issue because you're, they're still using screens. Uh, they can also, because of the high state of stress, become oppositionally defiant because they feel out of control in their bodies. And so they try to exert control by telling you no as the parent or the person in authority. You have heightened social anxiety and you can be kind of really quiet and really uncomfortable in face-to-face -face social interactions. So if you think about your social ability to talk with somebody, that's something that takes a lot of practice. Basically just tolerance, like you build up tolerance to deal with those things. If you have a uh, stunted frontal lobe, you may not have um, good social skills. You may not also have mood regulation. And so because of this, you have this, again, this perfect storm where these kids are having their, um, you know, they might get in a fight and then because they get in a fight, they get really angry and then they may break down in tears and then everybody's like, what the heck, man? Why are you so upset? This was not a big thing. Or maybe you feel like people are out to get to you. Maybe you're holding grudges. Maybe you're calling people stupid, but all of those things. So you have these kids that if you're around that kid, you're probably thinking, hmm, I really like being around that kid. He calls me stupid. He cries. He always gets his own way. You know, he can dish it, but he can't take it. That kind of thing. And you aren't going to be want to be around them. But the thing is, 
that is going to lead that kid to be more ostracized. And so because of that, they're never gonna wanna put themselves out there. Now, the reason why this can create a perfect storm of technology is because technology can provide the outlet for that kid to get social interaction. But really, it's a fake kind of social interaction. And so what they're doing is they're turning to technology to basically give them something that they need to actually turn to other people. And so they're never getting the practice with the real people to get over, you know, some of those issues that they have with social skills and they're going to technology. So it's this perfect cycle where they never actually grow and learn how to connect with other people because they're continually turning back to screens. And so they developed social anxiety because they never overcome those social interactions. So summing it up, screen time, it's affecting us in many, many, many ways. And for the most part, it's negative. There are really great ways that you can use technology as a tool. Again, this, I'm using technology as a tool. Being able to do your budget online, online banking, all of those things, I'm sure you could find a negative with it, but I think it's a positive. Instacart, I love it. But for our kids, there are so many negatives. And I think the issue is that we don't realize that it's a negative. So yeah, there are things that we can use technology for, but there are so many negatives for our kids that they don't realize that they're becoming addicted to these things. It reminds me a lot, and she even mentions this in the book, that it's kind of like the old cigarette companies where, you know, they there's all these studies and all these things that show that this is negative for our kids and it's become, making them be maladjusted to regular life. But because there's so much money involved in it, nobody knows about it. And so nobody knows the dangers. And it's going to be, you know, 25 years down the road. And then we're going to realize, oh my gosh, all these people are having lives that were not lived to the best of their ability because we didn't put limits on in the beginning. So now that you know about all of this, you might be like, eh, I'm still not convinced. But if you are convinced, the next question is, okay, well, what am I going to do about it? And I think the the thing that we think of is how could you actually, how could you possibly live with no screens? How would that even look? Again, for me, there have been so many times where I have wanted to not have screens at home because I see what it does to my son. My son is the same where where he loves to watch, we call them trucks. Seriously, like these little trucks that he likes to watch or Paw Patrol. And so he he's addicted to it. He asks for it um, whenever he can. And if we turn it on, he would sit there and watch for hours. But I recognize that if I let him do that, the next thing he's doing is he's picking up a pillow and trying to hit his sister. Or he won't sleep. Or he has meltdowns. And so I can see the effects where if he's not watching screens... And we've done a good job of limiting that and maybe only watching, you know, a couple hours a week. If I can do that, I see a big difference in his behavior. But there are so many things that make me want to let him watch screens. Uh, Dunkley mentions this. She says that there's a lack of screen related social activities. So a lot of times you think, okay, they're playing with their friends on the game. And so because of that, you need to let them have screens because this is how they connect with their friends. Or same thing with the phone. So, you know, all their friends have phones. They all Snapchat each other. And so this is one I need to let them do. No uh, non-screen related breaks for parents. So, you know, sometimes you just need screens or you feel like you need screens because you need to vacuum the living room or mop the floor or make dinner. And so you really, what that's getting at is the fact that you need some breaks built in. And she talks a lot about having a social network that can help you out so that you feel like you are able to, you know, overcome those situations. And also it's just a potential lifestyle change um, because you can't tell your kids that they should never be on a screen if you are on a screen 24 seven. What she recommends is doing a three week fast as like a reset You can also change your screen time use indefinitely, obviously, but it's hard to imagine what that would actually look like. And so this is where the TechWise family comes in. So again, last week, what I did is I read the TechWise uh, family commitments that the author, Andy Crouch, recommended for his family. And I think that those commitments show you the richness of a no screen lifestyle. So yeah, he's, it's a book that's written from the perspective of a father, 
that's passing along wisdom to other families. But I think it's important for anybody, if you are passionately trying to pursue Christ, so this is, this is a real talk, if you are passionately trying to pursue Christ in your life, then I think ESS, it really affects you. And I, I think it affects your ability to be sober-minded. And so because of that, I think you're inhibited in your ability to really live fully for God if you're constantly trying to get back on screens, especially screens that it's not like you're trying to encourage anybody or share the gospel. You're mindlessly taking in entertainment. And so I think it's something that you need to, you need to really think about what that means for you. Uh, we want to be sober-minded, and that means we have to be very diligent about not letting screens rule our life. Um, so again, Andy Crouch, he's an author, speaker, musician, dad. He wrote Tech Wife's Family to describe the life he had created with his kids that severely limited screens. So he begins the book with the following statement. I'll read it to you. It says, this book is about how to find the proper place for technology in our family lives and how to keep it there. If it was only as simple as cleaning up a bunch of stuffed animals. Technology is literally everywhere in our homes, not only the devices in our pockets, but the invisible electromagnetic waves that flood our home. This change has come about overnight in the blink of an eye in terms of human history and culture. When technology is in its proper place, it can be a tool that connects others, like we're doing right now. But it facilitates creativity and communication, and it can showcase the beauty of everyday life. But outside of its proper place, we are creating the people that are facing the effects of ESS, as we described before. And so basically what he recommends is that you have two uh, tools to put technology in its proper place nudges and disciplines. So nudges are changes in our environments that lead to less use of technology, like switching your phone to grayscale, which I mentioned in the last episode. And then disciplines are repeated habits that are crucial to develop in our everyday lives. So here are his TechWise commitments. So I'm going to read them again. I read them in the last episode, but they're really, really important uh, for you to understand. So the first one is we develop wisdom and courage together as a family. We want to create more than we consume, so we fill the center of our home with things that reward skill and active engagement. We are designed for a rhythm of work and rest, so one hour a day, one day per week, and one week per year, we turn off our devices and worship, feast, play, and rest together. We wake up before our devices do, and they go to bed before we do. We aim for no screens before double digits at home and at school. We use screens for a purpose and we use them together rather than using them aimlessly and alone. Car time is conversation time. Spouses have one another's passwords and parents have total access to children's devices. We learn to sing together rather than letting recorded and amplified music take over our lives and worship. We show up in person for the big events of life. We learn how to be human by being fully present in our moments of greatest vulnerability. We hope to die in one another's arms. So again, that's from the TechWise family by Andy Crouch. So let's break down some of the key components that connect all of these commitments together. So first, as a people, we need to connect in person about the things that matter, not over screens about vanities and petty squabbles. Technology is inhibiting our ability for intimacy. In her book, Reclaiming Conversation, Sherry Turkle describes how humans, they need about seven minutes. So See if you can do this. Set a timer for seven minutes and try to get there. We need about seven minutes to get into a deep, real conversation with somebody. And the issue with technology is that every time that we sit down, it's not like you can add up little bits and spurts and it adds up to seven minutes. With technology, every time that we look at a phone, we are interrupting that time and we have to start over. And so... For many people, we're never getting to those seven minutes, and so we're never really getting to intimacy. And so, whether it's music or podcasts or other screens, it's elbowed its way into time that was normally dedicated to conversation, like car rides, family dinners, or late night talks with friends. And getting that face-to-face -face interaction and conversation that we need to have real intimacy is so we have to set boundaries and limits on our technology use to facilitate that conversation. And that brings us to the second one. We need to put limits and boundaries on our screen time to control them instead of letting them control us. 
technology is like clutter. I was thinking about this. I just decluttered my house. Maybe I'll do a podcast on that sometime. But I just decluttered my house and I went through and I gave so much stuff away and I went through and I got so much uh, trash. But what I realized is a lot of this stuff, it's not that I never declutter my house. It's that it just comes to your house and it stays there and it multiplies and you don't even realize why your house is so cluttered or how it got that cluttered until you're trying to clean it out. Technology, it's like clutter. It's like a weed. It's invasive and it creeps into our lives without us actually even realizing that it's happening. I've been trying to control my screen time for a long time and this is important to me. Um, Go through these waves and I think we all do where there's times where I've said, hey, my son, he's not going to watch Paw Patrol anymore. And then a month later, I realized, oh my gosh, we've been watching this show for five hours today. And I have to stop and say, no, I don't want this to be my life. And so I go through good times and bad times. But what's important is you create limits and boundaries. And we're only going to watch TV on Friday nights for movie nights. I talked about movie nights uh, last week as part of curation. But if you say, I'm only going to watch TV then, it's so much easier to decline the TV at other times. Or if you say, you know, we're only going to watch one football game a week. Or I'm only going to look at Facebook for 15 minutes. It can limit your time, set boundaries on it, and it, then it doesn't creep into other, other areas of your life. Um, in addition to this, you uh, can set boundaries by also limiting when your kids receive things. Or even, you know, if you're talking about just for yourself, if you, um, the place where you use that thing. So for your kids to set limits for them, set boundaries for them, um, you can set the age where they can receive something like the age where they receive their own tablet or the age where they receive their own phone. Um, I was one of those weird kids. I wasn't able to get a smartphone until I graduated from high school. And I was upset by that whenever I was younger, but really I think that that helped me to develop, to develop a more healthy relationship with technology. Um, I had a little like smartphone and it didn't even have texting on it. It was back where you could, you know, you had to pay per text. And so because of that, I couldn't text anybody. Now I did, I did have a laptop because I had several um, classes. I took college classes and stuff. And so there were some ways that I used technology well whenever I was in high school and some ways that I didn't, but it helped me to limit my time and I have a more healthy relationship now. So I think if you have this threshold boundary for the age where your kids get technology, I think that's important. Um, it says to wait until the double digits, but Dunkley recommends wait as long as you possibly can. You know, 16, that's good. <laughs> Later than that, that's great. Um, you have the phone, you need to have it in a common area. So basically control where it lives. I've even done this myself where, you know, I have my charging station and instead of having it right beside my bed, my charging station is in the kitchen. And so because of that, I don't bring my phone to bed with me. So I don't look at, you know, social media first thing in the morning or last thing at night in general. And you can probably remember this from your life. Nothing good comes from phone usage at bedtime. And so it's, better just to not even have that be an issue for you or for your kids. Um, It should stay plugged up where you know your child isn't using it. And for you too, if there's a true emergency, people know where to find you. They can show up at your house. (laughs) But falling asleep while looking at your phone, it's not going to help you at all. And it just leads to non-restorative sleep. You need boundaries and breaks that require um, discipline and also nudges. Another idea uh, that you could do is I've heard people, and I think uh, Andy Crouch talks about this in his book, and then also the author of Habits of the Household talks about this, but they um, even create something that makes them not use as much TV um, by using a projector instead of a TV. And so every time that they want to watch something, they have to get out the projector. So you can also do a total screen fast or Sabbath. So if you were one of those people that you were on tech all the time, you could even turn off everything on Sunday. So again, just tell somebody, you know, if you live close to a friend or your parents or a sibling, you can say, hey, look, I don't have my phone on. So if you need me, know that my phone's not on. So you need to come by my house if there is an emergency. And generally that would be something, I mean, that's not that big of a deal and people used to do that all the time. So that would be a way um, that you could really severely limit your time. But one thing that's important is that you need to replace that screen time 
with something fun that you enjoy. So you don't want to go from something dopamine producing to absolutely nothing. You're not going to stick with your new habit. You need to find something else that makes you happy and that will make your new lifestyle enjoyable. Lastly, we value real rest, movement, nature, creativity, and worship rather than the counterfeit versions of these that technology provides. So we need to replace screen time with real things. And there are so many real and beautiful things in life. Screen time, it offers counterfeit versions of all these good gifts that God commanded us to have, to use, and to enjoy. So we think, oh, a night at home, this is so relaxing. But if you look at your phone the whole time, or if you watch, you know, if you're binge watching Netflix, that's not true rest. True rest is a Sabbath. If you are singing a song with your friends, or if you're worshiping, you know that that's a different experience than if you're just listening to, you know, music in the background mindlessly. If it are even something as simple as sports, you know, we watch sports all the time, but there's a very different feeling from watching sports versus playing, you know, pickleball with your friends or uh, football or, or ultimate frisbee. Those are very different feelings. And so all of those things are things that we need to experience the real version of these and not just the thing that's created or mediated through screens. One of the issues that I found is that whenever we repeatedly turn to technology to satisfy our cravings to do hard things such as singing or movement, worship, rest, time outside, doing the actual thing becomes too much, as my students would say. It becomes too difficult, too hard, and not as immediately rewarding. And without practice, that thing will never be rewarding. I have to get used to the weather, the bugs, and the sun, or lack of it, to enjoy my time outside. If I listen to recorded music all the time and I never exercise my voice, I'm never going to get good at singing. If I am just turning to watching sports to satisfy my need for movement and competition, I'm never going to get better at playing it myself and I'm just going to stop. And so we need to practice these things to truly get better at them and to reap their benefits. This requires us to risk being different. And so to sum up today, I hope, I hope, I hope that you think about the risk of going no screens and the rewards. We've talked about both today. We've talked about all of the negative impacts of screens. And we've also talked about the rewards of living with no screens. So would you be willing to risk being different, to risk the no screens lifestyle to truly grow and change, to have better working minds, bodies, and relationships? What do you think? Would you risk it? Would you want to reap the rewards? Thank you so much for listening. And I hope that you'll come join the conversation at a more beautiful life collective on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can comment on um, any of the posts. You can also uh, message me there. If what we've talked about today has interested you, if you have comments about it, I also really encourage you to get a copy of reset your child's brain, the tech wise family and habits of the household. That's always my recommendation. If you're interested in any of these general habits, you can get a link to all those books in the show notes. If you purchase it through the link, I get a small commission, which is helpful and it's at no cost to you. Uh, if you haven't yet, please leave a rating and review. Just let me know what you think. I would love to hear it. Um, And that helps us get the word out about the show. Next week, we are going to jump into the importance of the habit of personal spiritual disciplines. And I hope... Thanks so much for joining me at the More Beautiful Life Collective podcast. I'm Casey Fletcher, and I hope I'll see you next week.